and take two. Good morning. Welcome to Aaron Mills Town Center, the home of the world's largest permanent point of purchase video wall installation. My name is Calvin Fluck, and I'm your video host all day here at EMTV. I want to take this opportunity to extend a very special and warm welcome to the film crew from Necessary Illusions. We've got an excellent lineup of television programming for you today, so let's get on with it. So how long have they been working on this documentary? Gosh, they've been working on it. I don't know how long, but they, I know every, every country I show up, they're always there. They're there, huh? Yeah, they were in England, they were in Japan, all over the place. Jeez. Like, they must have 500 hours worth of tape by wow. now. But they put together a real doozy when they're done, huh? I can't imagine just going to want to hear somebody talk for an hour, but <laughs> <laughs> I guess they know what they're doing. Well, where are y'all from? Florida. 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 Yeah. yeah. Hong Kong. Y'all talk yeah. like a chorus. <laughs> We're making a film about Noam Chomsky. Does anybody know who Noam Chomsky is? No. Oh. <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to Wyoming Talks. My guest today is well-known intellectual Noam Chomsky. Thank you for being on our program today. Very glad to be here. Well, I know probably the main purpose for your trip to Wyoming is to discuss thought control in a democratic society. Now, I'd say I'm just uh, Jane USA, and I say, well, gee, this is a uh, democratic society, and what do you mean thought control? I make up my own mind. I, I create my own destiny. What would you say to her? Mm -hmm. Well, I would suggest that Jane take a close look at uh, the way the media operate, the way the public relations in uh, industry operates, uh, the extensive thinking that's been going on for a long, long period about the necessity for finding ways to marginalize and control the public in democratic society. But particularly to look at the evidence that's been accumulated about the way the major media, the sort of agenda-setting media, I mean the national press and the television and so on, the way that they shape and control the kinds of opinions that appear, the kinds of information that comes through, the sources to which they go, and so on. And I think that Jane will find some very surprising things about the democratic system. I'd like to welcome all of you to this lecture today. Several years ago, Professor Chomsky was described in the New York Times book review as follows. Judged in terms of the power, range, novelty, and influence of his thought, Noam Chomsky is arguably the most important intellectual alive. Professor Noam Chomsky. I gather there are some people out behind that blackness there, but if I don't look you in the eye, it's because I don't see you. All I see is the blackness. Uh, perhaps I ought to begin by reporting something that's never read. Uh, the line about the arguably the most important intellectual in the world and so on comes from a publisher's blurb, and you also always got to watch those things, <laughs> because if you go back to the original, you'll find that that sentence is actually there. This is in the New York Times. But the next sentence is, since that's the case, how can he write such terrible things about American foreign policy? <laughs> and they never quote that point. 
but in fact, if it wasn't for that second sentence, I would begin to think that I'm doing something wrong. And I'm not joking about that. Uh, it's true that the emperor doesn't have any clothes, but the emperor doesn't like to be told it. And the emperor's uh, lapdogs, like the New York Times, are not going to uh, enjoy the experience if you do. Good evening. I'm Bill Moyers. What's more dangerous, the big stick or the big lie? Governments have used both against their own people. Tonight I'll be talking with a man who has been thinking about how we can see the developing lie. He says that propaganda is to democracy what violence is to a dictatorship. But he hasn't lost faith in the power of common people to speak up for the truth. You have said that we live entangled in webs of endless deceit. That we live in a highly indoctrinated society where elementary truths are easily buried. Mm -hmm. Elementary truths such as? Such as the fact that we invaded South Vietnam. Or the fact that we're standing in the way of significant, and have for years, of significant moves towards uh, arms negotiation. Or the, the fact that the military system is to an, a substantial extent, not totally, but to a substantial extent, a mechanism by which the general population is compelled to provide a subsidy to high technology industry. Since they're not going to do it, if you ask them to, you have to deceive them into doing it. I think there are many truths like that, and we don't face them. Do you believe in common sense? I mean, you're oh, absolutely. You I do believe in, in Cartesian common sense. I think people have the capacities to uh, see through the deceit in which they're ensnared, but they got to make the effort. Seems a little incongruous to hear a man from the ivory tower of Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a scholar, a distinguished linguistics uh, scholar, talk about common people with such appreciation. I think that scholarship, at least the field that I work in, uh, has the opposite consequences. By my own studies in language and human cognition uh, demonstrate, to me at least, what remarkable creativity ordinary people have. The very fact that people talk to one another is a reflection, and just in the normal way, I don't mean anything particularly fancy, uh, reflects deep-seated features of human creativity, which in fact separate human beings from any other biological system we know. Tonight, scientists talk to the animals, but are they talking back? The Journal with Barbara Frum and Mary Lou Finley. Communicating with animals is a serious scientific pursuit. This is Nim Chomsky. Nim, jokingly named after the great linguist Noam Chomsky, was the great hope of animal communication in the 1970s. For four years, Petito and others coached him in sign language. But in the end, they decided it was a lost cause. Nim could ask for things, but not much more. I would have loved to have a conversation with Nim and understand how he looked at the universe. He failed to communicate that information to me. Now we, and we gave him every opportunity. Noam Chomsky, theorist of language and political activist, has had an extraordinary career. I can think of none like it in recent American history and few anywhere at any time. He has literally transformed the subject of linguistics. At the same time, he's become one of the most consistent critics of power politics in all its protean guises. Scholar and propagandist, his two careers apparently reinforce each other. In 1957, he published his Syntactic Structures, which began what has frequently been called the Chomskyan Revolution in Linguistics. Like a latter-day Copernicus, Chomsky proposed a radically new way of looking at the theory of grammar. Chomsky worked out the formal rules of a universal grammar which generated the specific rules of actual or natural languages. The general approach I'm taking seems to me rather simple-minded uh, and unsophisticated, but nevertheless correct. Uh, <laughs> Later he came to argue that such systems are innate features of human beings. They belong to the characteristics of the species and have been, in effect, programmed into the genetic equipment of the mind like the machine language in a computer. Uh, one needn't be interested in this question. Of course, I am interested in it. And the interesting question from this point of view would be what is the nature of the initial state? That is, what is human nature in this respect? That, in turn, explains the... Astonishing 
you try that out next to him. Facility. 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 That in turn explains the astonishing facility that children have in learning the rules of natural language, no matter how complicated, incredibly quickly, from what are imperfect and often degenerate samples. Complain. Complicated. Complicated. It's a complicated word. Do you know what complicated means? It means it's complicated. If, in fact, our minds were a blank slate and experience wrote on them, we would be very impoverished creatures indeed. So the obvious hypothesis is that our language is the result of the unfolding of a genetically determined program. Well, plainly, there are different languages. In fact, the apparent variation of languages is quite superficial. It's certain, as, as, as certain as anything else, is that humans are not genetically programmed to learn one or another language. So you bring up a Japanese baby in Boston, it'll speak Boston English. And you bring up my child in Japan, it'll speak Japanese. Uh, and that means that the base, that from, that it fo from, from that it simply follows by logic that the basic structure of the languages must be essentially the same. Our task as uh, scientists is to try to determine exactly what those fundamental principles are that cause the knowledge of language to unfold in the manner in which it does under particular circumstances. And incidentally, I think there is no doubt the same must be true of other aspects of human intelligence and uh, uh, systems of understanding and interpretation and uh, moral and aesthetic judgment and so on. The implications of these views have washed over the fields of psychology, education, sociology, philosophy, literary criticism, and logic. In the 50s and 60s, the bridge between your theoretical work and your political work seems to have been the attack on behaviorism. But now, behaviorism is no longer an issue, or so it seems. So how does this leave the link between your linguistics and your politics? Well, I've always regarded the link. I, I've never really perceived much of a link, to tell you the truth. Again, I would be very pleased to be able to discover intellectually convincing connections between my own anarchist convictions on the one hand and what I think I can demonstrate or at least begin to see about the nature of human intelligence on the other. But I simply can't find intellectually satisfying connections between those two domains. I can discover some tenuous points of contact.